Well, welcome to uh, Fair UK Legends in Bartending, and today we have the amazing drum roll, please. Du -du 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 -du. P. Marshall. <sighs> hey, Dean P. You all right? Very well, mate. How are you? I'm very, very excited about today. Not just interviewing the legends, but a very, very good friend. Very like, uh, I don't know how long we've known each other. <laughs> it's been quite a while. I felt like I knew you before I even knew you because all the stories that used to come out about you when I first started at Friday. So okay. I think we've officially known each other for uh, probably about 16 or 17 years. But we, we, we haven't aged one bit, have we? <laughs> so let me go through when you, you joined in 1999. OK, uh, the movie at the time was Fight Club. So it's quite a cool film. Really good film. Uh, Ricky Martin <laughs> came out with Living La Vita Loca. That was the uh, song yeah. at the time. So, yeah, go on. And Sopranos actually came out. So so what job did you do before TJ Fridays in 99? So they were, um, they were opened up the Fridays Blue Water back in 99. Um, I'd seen an advert in the, the local paper. And at that particular point for a couple of years, Prior to that, I've been working at like a, a local Tex-Mex restaurant. Um, I've been doing a, a bit of bar backing, um, a bit of children's entertaining, Pistol Pete the Cowboy, for those that remember. <laughs> that was uh, they were some fun times. So I was doing that when I was doing my A-levels. And then 99 came around, uh, Fridays were opening up blue. Um, and I just applied along with many thousands of others. Um, I managed to get a job as a dub um, as a part of the opening team. So yeah, no, before that, same industry, but sort of working my way through school at the same time. And then everyone kept talking about Fridays and how cool it was and et cetera. I'd, I'd never been. So my first engagement with it was actually at an interview when it was, um, it was, it was Dan Housingo who was one of the, uh, the interviewee, uh, interviewing party, Peter Blake and a few of those. And that was actually my first experience of it. So yeah, 99 um, was, a, was an exciting year in the journey. <laughs> did, you, uh, did you audition or was it an interview? they done some interviews at um, like a conservative club or something like that. So, um, so I think they were doing two or three days of interviews and it was, it was an audition interview, but they were churning through people like anything. So I think they, they said there was a couple of thousand um, applicants or a few thousand applicants for what was essentially about 150 jobs at the time or something like that. So um, yeah, it was, yeah, it was an audition, but they, they had us doing lots of, um, Various fun and games at the interview. I think just obviously just trying to test to see if they were the type of people that could put a dog on their head and run around the restaurant screaming. <laughs> so, actually, on that note, because um, your nickname was Beagle, uh, so how did that come about? <laughs> yeah, do you know what? And this is this is still painful to this day. So it's not anything cool. It's nothing like to be overly proud about. When I first started as a dub many many moons ago, back in '99. And we did used to wear the silly hats um, the way we did. I just had this hat from when I was about seven years old, and it was literally a dog hat. And it had big floppy ears. It had a big old nose on it, which squeaked when you did that to it. And this thing was just a, it was just a dog hat. And it was just the, the stupidest hat that I could find at the time. So I wore it a couple of times. And the administrator at the time, I think her name was Jill, um, she just changed my name on the system to Beagle. And that was literally how it came about. So... As a result of wearing a hat for about three months, I think my name up in head office was down as Beagle as well. And no one knows where the name came from, but this administrator changed it on a Monday. And within about two years, the whole world knows that I'm a bloody Beagle. It was, uh, yeah, no, nothing overly exciting. So I tried to phase it out over time, but it's still sticking. Even now people still say Beagle and I'm like, oh God, <laughs> I had other hats. <laughs> well, you act like, because uh, I think I'm not, I'd say don't quote me on this, but I think it's true. I think uh, uh, Blue Water was the 30th TGR Fridays in the UK, number 30. Something yeah. like, might have, been, might have been the 32nd from it. But I'm, Some, uh, probably. And uh, oh, a busy, busy store. Absolutely busy, busy store. And there's no doubt about it. I mean, like, uh, apart from we've done a lot of talks about Common Garden, Haymarket, but Blue Water did have uh, an amazing, amazing sales reputation. Um, when you joined the bar, I mean, who t uh, did you all learn at the same time? Or did you, because you was a dub-dub, weren't you? I was a dub-dub on the side. 
and then you went on to the bar. So what, did you put your name forward or was there a shortage on the bar? How did that come about? I have a bit of, um, bit of a longer story behind that as well. So sadly, um, there was a girl called Lenny that was working on the bar at the time who was involved in quite a bad car accident. So it meant that essentially the team was left one short. I think it was probably about six months into the opening of of the store. They had brought in a couple of bartenders. Uh, you had Ray Murphy had come over from Lakeside. Do you remember Ray? Yeah. Ray, Ray had come over, he joined the bar team. Um, and they had obviously interviewed and, and put in some some guys. Initially, you had, you had Scott Hawks, you had Jazz, uh, you had Leon, Neil Finnis. Um, so Lenny was one of those as well, Ray. And that was the original sort of bar team from memory, if I've forgotten anyone. And you're bothering to watch this with me on here, I apologise if I've forgotten you. But that was sort of the original team, and uh, Lenny had got into this, this this car accident, and at the time, um, the bar team had basically asked, is there someone within the store that you'd like to, to come onto the bar? And apparently they took the silly step of saying that, yeah, that guy there would be quite good on the bar, let's put him on the bar. And I hadn't even thought about it at that stage. I was just running around the restaurant in a silly dog hat, squeaking my nose at people, and all of a sudden the bar team... I didn't realise there was quite a um, there was there was quite a waiting list to get on the Friday's bars at that time. So it was it's actually quite an honour that the team wanted me to jump on and sort of start doing the learning. Oh, there you go. I am going to get killed for this. Snoxy, I apologise. Matt Snoxy was my trainer. <laughs> I forgot to Snoxy. I forget him. But Snoxy was on there. Neil um, Neil Miller was on there as well. Um, but yeah, no, so yeah, the, the, the team sort of said, uh, there you go, that guy will do. He looks, uh, looks like someone we can bully for a little while and, uh, see how he gets on. So that was, that was my journey from dub to bar. So, um, so with, uh, Snoxall, cause obviously Snoxall won the UK's in Snoxall 2003. Yeah. So you had like the UK champion training you on the bar. So, which is well, quite good. He wasn't the UK champion at the time. So I actually competed against him in that UK final. That was yeah. my first ever. That was my first ever competition, and I come fourth. So, wow. was that so, in the UKs? Was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was um, that was my first uh, challenge as well. So at the time, I was covering Crawley's Bar, um, so I wasn't at Blue Water. So obviously, I wasn't representing Crawley per se. But I've been doing a cover down there for probably three or four months, um, and then the, the regionals come around. So I ended up doing the regionals out of Crawley. Um, and then yeah, made uh, made the UK final on a wild card. I think there was, I think it was five master bartenders, me and someone else. Um, mm. And I was, I was, I'll be honest, I was a bit disappointed that I ended up coming fourth. I felt like I could have pushed for the top three, but I think I was messing around with some sort of gizmo on the bar that I was doing. I ran out of a bit of time, and it cost me a few points and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But to be fair, it was nice that Matt won, and I do remember. When Matt won, we um, we looked at each other because it was going to be one of us two that had come first. Clearly, you don't remember that. So clearly, fourth place is no good to anyone. There's no who remembers fourth place. Mm. It was well, nice so, giving Matt giving Matt well, a nice pick well, up. Through it because obviously um, you won the uh, UK, you won the Europeans, and you won the world in 2005. I mean, was that your second competition? Yeah, yeah. So the first that's, one. That's first, incredible. I mean, it only took it only took me ten. <laughs> <laughs> So, like, um, yeah, because when I looked at it, I was going, is there anything else, like, when you see all the other bartenders that, like, uh, a couple of years beforehand or three or four years, the night comes around, that you just went, bang, straight in there with just... I left Fridays for a year in between as well. So, I think I think for all of it, I say, I, I, uh, there's some names in that list when you look back through the, the back of the book, and I do kind of appear out of nowhere. Mm. But I always... Consistency in bartending and being good at what you're doing day in, day out, that's all I, I think is going to get the best people in the right spots at the right times. Yeah. So in that, that that particular first challenge, um, I think I surprised myself a little bit, if only for the fact that I knew that I was quite solid at what I was able to do. Mm -hmm. um, so being recognised and ended up making the final based on a wild card and coming forth. I wasn't completely surprised, but obviously it was it was still... It was an honour, the fact that I'd made it that far um, and got to compete against Matt, who trained me, um, let alone with Matt winning. And say so that was a nice moment on the bar at Bayswater when he um, when he got announced. But yeah, so after that, I ended up leaving Fridays for a, probably about seven or eight months, maybe a year. Um, and I hadn't even planned on coming back, per se. I bought a property locally. Um, mm -hmm. And at the time, I was working right around the M25 at Hampton Court and just sort of put a call in the blue water, said, listen, I'm... 
just bought myself a property that's nearby. I don't want to be traveling to Hampton Court anymore. Any chance I can come back on the bar? Mm -hmm. um, and Peter Blake had left a little note at Blue Water saying if Beagle ever wants to come back and have a bartender job, take him back on. Mm -hmm. um, so I rocked back up and then I think within a month or two, it was the challenge again. So I wasn't ready for it. Um, and I'd been out of out of the circuit for quite a while. But yeah, no, entered round by round. Um, mm. And it sort of slotted back into place as it as it had done two years before. So yeah, no, it was, a, it was quite a, a different journey to some of the others. Mm. Did you like, um, uh, did you buy into the Fridays thing? You know, like the... The clutter, the the Fridays, you know, theories. Did you enjoy that part of it? I yeah, I did. I did. I, I found it ultimately. I found it quite cheesy, but that's what it's meant to be about, and I get that. But there is, there are still terms that I use. We we like within the business. We started. I've got a lot of Fridays guys um, working for me now. I've got some some really yeah. some really cool. I've got some ex bartenders. I've sent people to Fridays as well. But because yeah. we sort of all use that, we will. We'll use the swan theory. We'll use the rowing boat theory. We'll we'll be sort of just talking about it by nature. So, I think because it sort of it changed over time in the various ways. I think I was there between the sort of the old Fridays and then the sort of as they were modernising it. There were different yeah. theories according to what they wanted to focus on at the time. So I did. I learned them, but it was mm. not something that was sort of the be all and the end all of my world. It was I'm here to bartend. I'm here to to do a job. Um, and if you want me to learn the other stuff as well, then by all means, I'll do that. So, but no, I'm respecting it. I've, I've always said, if you cut me in half, I'm a bit like you. I'll still bleed red and white. Still love the cuts. <laughs> yes. No, it, yeah, I, I, I enjoyed the ethos of everything that they were putting together. And I, even to this day, I still cite that as my learning journey to where I am now, because I believed in the customer service element of stuff. And that's as a result of everything that I was taught mm -hmm. back in 99 and then, beyond that so no it was uh yeah no it's good it's good did you um did you obviously like um you loved the, making the cocktails obviously you enjoyed making the drinks and everything else did you um did you have a thing for the food at fridays or was it a good combination of both or was it just more about the drinks and not too much about the side of the actual food side of it i think i think fridays as a product was the right product um it just, it, it, if, if you want my honest opinion, I didn't think the food was ever that great. But when you wrap it up with a brilliant atmosphere, um, a great group of people serving it to you, the bartenders with bundles of energy and things like that, it was what it was and it was everything that it needed to be. But there, there, there are better food products out there if you're talking about that quite specifically. But what I, I bought into was the whole package. I enjoyed the package of, um, it's not about necessarily the best products is about wrapping it all up to make everything a brilliant product and that was yeah having passionate people working around you on the floor on the bar um and just having sort of an excitable atmosphere um i think the food was important but i think it in reality it was second to everything else um that was going on so yeah no it's yeah 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 the, the, the food was there but the, the bar side of it was more uh for me definitely what i enjoyed in the end i enjoyed dubbing actually it was quite good fun it's when you come over to blue i'll never forget yeah. we, we wouldn't let you on the bar initially would we that rob stevens he's coming over <laughs> who's he think he is we're making starters at dub he can't come on our bar and i think you were on the you were on the floor for a couple of months myself i can't remember <laughs> <laughs> all, I, all I remember was like I, I don't know where I came from Haymarket actually at the time because um yeah I think it was Haymarket so I went to because obviously I heard about the sales and that Blue Wall were doing and after doing Haymarket which was absolutely like life changing it was just literally like get to see uh, how you do certain sales in such a short period of time and and mixing it was just the whole like pushing your level you know trying to get better than you was beforehand and uh there was after Haymarket, where'd you go there's not many places you can go to and obviously when i went to blue water um i loved it absolutely enjoyed every second of it just the um love the cinema <laughs> love the shops outside just the the whole uh blue water was completely a amazing place even outside of blue water just the the, the park area around the outside of not, not many people go to. And I used to go there, do a bit of a run around the block yeah. before starting work and parking was easy. It just um, blew, and also friends for life as well. I mean, 
I'm still in touch with lots of friends from Blue Water as well. So uh, yeah, definitely um, the best place going. At, you know, like you do get friends for life when you work for Fridays. Every store I've worked, you know, you come away with half a dozen great friends. I mean, amazing friends. They will take a bullet for you. <laughs> I, I'd, I'd agree with you there. I mean, I work, I've done a lot of covers and a lot, a lot of sort of, um, I've done various training. I've done, I was up at Enfield at one point, Mill Hill, Crawley, and it was more bouncing around, but ultimately my home base was always Blue Water and I always enjoyed that. And I think we had a cracking team there, but it was all, all different animals. When we were talking about the sales and the amount of milkshakes we used to make at Blue, it was, that weren't cocktail making, that was just ice cream scooping. And we did an awful lot of ice cream scooping now. So yeah. but it, it, different things. I think we had, we had a different kind of atmosphere and a different kind of ambiance and, yeah. yeah, it was like when we, the year that we won Best Bar, that was, um, that was, uh, yeah. I think that there were other bars like Haymarket and Covent Garden that would have disputed that um, because of the sales that they do or some of the aspects that they did. But you can't really judge a bar team without being within in amongst it all. And that blue bar team, if it hadn't have won something at some stage, would have probably been a discredit to how good it was, although it would never have been like the Haymarket bar team at the time. They were a brilliant bar team. We were a brilliant bar team, but all for different reasons. And so, no, it was, um, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It, you can't I, think once, just... I think at one stage we had like 10 people um, that were in the UK final at that one one year. Yeah. It was just absolutely, we had like two tandem teams. We had about four in individual flair. We had about four people in best bartender. It was just ridiculous. And how many people that just from one store was in one competition. It was just uh, ridiculous. So. Uh, yeah me of when a cult when you get a good culture and everyone's pushing each other because that that didn't happen instantly that that took three or four years of everyone mm -hmm. sort of competing against each other in store just day to day and having a load of fun and enjoying that atmosphere of it and that's why I, yeah i remember that year i think um mm -hmm. 2005 i think it was 2004 um yeah. that we, we we won the best bar if i'm rightly in the 2003 matt had obviously done um uk's that year and uh, so that was just, uh, I think that was that, that period, it didn't make us necessarily the best bar team in the country, but we had so many strengths going on between sort of some in tandem, some in individual, we were getting best bartenders through and stuff like that, but that was just down to a whole team of people doing that together. And it was great fun to see and be a part of. I noticed, um, uh, did you ever do your masters? <laughs> uh, kind of. So after my first UK final, um, yeah. I contacted Ray Weeks and I said, Weeksy, listen, I've just come forth in the UK. Uh, yeah. I'm still only a certified bartender. I should probably do my master's because there's nothing I don't know right now, including my sensitivities. <laughs> <laughs> so um, he said, Carl, we'll do you on a, a crash course on the master's. And so yeah. we set it all up and I basically I, I, I smashed through all of the tests in about a week. Um, oh. Literally just ripped through them as fast as I could. Um, yeah. But then obviously I had to do my observations and stuff like that. And I never got around to doing the observations, which I ended up leaving a month or two later. Just another job offer had come up, um, sort of a bit of what I thought was going to be a progression for me, um, yeah. which is why I went around to Hampton Court in that sort of area. Um, so mm. I finished it. I'd done it. By the time, if you, back in that era, if you were in a UK final, you were basically a master bartender. There was no, I, don't, I didn't get me cap, um, but I got a world title instead. But you did, I, I didn't have any cap, but that UK final, there, I was untouchable in terms of my knowledge. As I say, a few mistakes I made on the final itself, if not, I would have placed. But yeah, no, it's, um, it's something that I, I feel a little bit sad that I never finished it because mm. it, I, I, it wasn't going to be anything that I couldn't do. Um, mm. But I didn't, so but what can I say? You, I've got, I've got a nice propeller in did you have any special ways of remembering the cocktails or did you just like Rolodex it or just write it down or yeah, any well, ways doing it? A bit of writing down, a bit of Rolodex and it would be learn one, put it to the back, learn the second one, repeat the first one, move on to the third one, go back through the first two again, go on to the, and it was just, just repetition more than anything else. You hear different stories of, the best one I always heard was, um, was Neil Finnis who, um, who, who just could not learn them for love nor money. And he ended up drawing pictures on A4 bits of paper for every single cocktail. So by the time he was certified, he basically had a hardback book of his own drawings. And to be fair, with no disrespect to Neil, he was a top bloke. He had yeah. a drawing 
like a six-year-old. So he basically created himself a little flip book. <laughs> and he's done good, bad so I'm, 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 oh, brilliant. That was that. Um, that was I was just repetition. If you were for me, if I went over it enough, it would stick. But equally, like the flip side of that is now, if you ask me what goes in the Sunset Boulevard, I don't stand a chance. <laughs> oh, sorry, I'll show you, Dave. I'll say you've done all your cocktail, you've done, um, you found that quite, you know, I'll say like just repetition works really, really well on that side of it. When did, um, so, so you've got like the new team come on board, uh, Blue Water, yeah? So how long was you in Blue Water in total? Sort of, um, I'd come onto the bar, it's been in and around 2000. To, first UK final was 03. So I was there for about three, three and a bit years. Um, and then away for a year and then back for another probably i think it was two years after i won the worlds i made the decision um so i didn't come back to do the competition or anything like that it just fell when i come back so um i entered one thought oh well i might as well do the europeans okay well i might as well do the worlds oh okay this is all right this and then it, it felt the, the right thing to do was to stick around um for at least another year not that i didn't enjoy what i was doing but i was trying to progress myself in mm -hmm. general uh, but out of respect for the company and the title that they'd given me, I felt right. No, I'll, I'll give them at least 12 months as the sort of the reigning champion. But in that time, um, they introduced sort of some some new aspects to how they were running the challenge. So mm. I went back. I was lucky enough to judge the following year, um, and equally where I'd set up and done the UKs, um, I, I basically managed the UK competition the year after I won. I adapted the UK competition, so it, I don't know what it looks like now but I brought it more in line with the international stuff. I just found that it was very different entering the UK to then going out to America and competing with people in almost mm. a different competition. So mm. I made a conscious decision for anyone coming through after me that it would be an easier transition for them going from the UK's competition out to the, the US or wherever the comp. So mm. I think, um, so I don't know how the format runs now, but I certainly, um, I certainly wanted to try and make the journey a little bit better so that we could get more UK winners. Um, yeah. But they'd be ready for it when they got out there rather than what I experienced when I got there. Because I still remember after day one being really upset that I things had happened that I just wasn't aware within their sort of rule structure and stuff yeah. like that. So We'll pick up on the world in a minute. So, yeah. so what was your strengths and weaknesses when you was at Fridays? Did you have any like uh, things that you wanted to work on? Was you a better frontsman or a better service person, service bar bartender? Well, no, or... I'm going to put that back at you, Rob. What was what was my best and my worst asset? You work with me. Come on. You tell Front me. Bar. <laughs> <laughs> Front bar. It was... You, you, your personality just sells you like you've got just a booming personality. So I always think to myself, no matter how good you are on service bar, you could be great, but your personality will just blow your service bar away always because like you're just a great guy. So, so I think so, yeah. if you, a bit like yourself, if you do Tony Adams, very similar, actually, a story about Tony in a minute, but I, I always believe that if you care about people, whether that be the people you're working with or the people that you're serving, then you, you can you can get away with many problems um, as long as you're engaging and having some fun with people and stuff like that. So even your mistakes can be smoothed over a little bit easier if you're someone that's e easy to speak to. And I remember even to this day, um, when Rob Champion had come back from doing an opening, I think it was um, Fulham or somewhere like that. And he said, oh, I've met a bartender that's very similar to you. and He's just as good as you. And I went, all right, yeah, who's this then? He went, oh, a guy called Tony Adams. I went, I don't like him already. So <laughs> anyway, for about 12 months, I kept hearing his name, Tony Adams. I'm like, oh, poxy scouse. And mm -hmm. I ended up meeting him. I'm like, oh, kind of like this guy. He's all right. So, and then I watched Tony work at the bar. And to be fair to what Rob said, when he said, um, you and Tony are very similar in terms of dynamics on the bar, I took it as a compliment. Having watched Tony work at the bar, I was like, do you know why if someone's comparing me to someone along those lines then uh, at the time i think it was it was pre the the uk's of the the one that i won but it was it was a nice compliment because so for all of it you can only admire a good bartending and obviously Tony falls into that category for sure so uh, before we forget because what i hate about these interviews is that i come away from the interview again oh i wish i asked him that question so the question i've got because you brought tony adams into the question so, and no one probably only a few people know this story that did you have like a, a bet with Tony Adams with you with your world championships? 
That's tell what. me more about this story. More, what's some, tell me all the story because I know roughly about it, but it would be nice to hear it from your own voice and also get it on recording as well. So how did this come about? It's probably not as exciting as everyone would lead it to believe, but um, it, it, as, as most of these stories do, it starts over a few beers and a bit of competition. <laughs> And it never at one moment entered an actual bar competition. It was just two big headed bartenders battling out on a basketball field in an arcade on a stag do in the rectum. <laughs> <laughs> so we were, we were away on, um, we were actually away on Vinnie Reed's stag do and we were out in the rectum. Uh, however, it just ended up me and Tony off playing away in the arcades. Tony was adamant as he is that he was better than me at something or other. And, um, I, I was adamant that I was better than him, and we kept playing this silly little basketball game. And he was getting anger and anger. And I was like, Mate, we're just we're just playing for world title. It's coming. If you're that good and you're that confident, <laughs> so we had the game, and I won that one. I think I won about three in a row. And in the end, he completely conceded it. So now we, um, if you ask him, he'll concede the fact. But I never got his propeller. So Tony, if you're watching this, I want that propeller. I want it hung above me there. <laughs> Brilliant story, absolutely it brilliant. Story. Like that. It was good fun though, yeah. So, of all the cocktails in Fridays, uh, which one do you love the most or enjoy making still? Or was there one that stood out? The go to drink was always the Vanya, weren't it? It was the easy one. That, there we go. What do you drink? Vodka? Okay, Uncle Vanya. Do you want something sweet? Uncle Vanya. Do you want, what, you want something red? Oh, I've got the perfect drink for you. It was. Uh, it was easy. It was a Collins. It was a bottle of Smirnoff. It was a lime wedge. You couldn't really go wrong, could you? So <laughs> yeah, the venue was the go-to for selling. But I will say, I, I, even from back when I, I first started, um, I know it's a very popular drink these days, but the old fashioned was always my drink back then. So mm -hmm. I, I, I enjoyed that was one of the more craftier cocktails at the time, whereas it, it was very disco drink. And they, I know they've evolved that over the years. Um, and at the time, didn't really sell a mojito or a mint julep for love nor money when we first started. Now, obviously, you see them everywhere. But the old fashioned back then, even then, I think that was uh, that was a drink that I I personally enjoyed and I would upsell to. Um, but the go to drink on a busy Saturday night, Uncle Vanya, Uncle Vanya, Uncle Vanya, Uncle Vanya, boom. <laughs> So uh, when you was actually because uh, like going back and forth, but because um, I, I like to actually. When I forget to say something about Fridays, I like to re-inject it because I always forget. Do you remember the pyramids that Fridays used to do before we used to open the doors? We yes. used to do like a pyramid. Was you part of that pyramid? Oh, when you used to dump that? I was always at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I was always at the bottom. So, uh, I don't even know. If I was too scared to go to the top. But it's got the smallest stub dub, didn't you? And stuck her on the top somewhere. So yeah, always the bar, the bar would be standing behind there, just loving the view. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so I like because obviously I like to mention because I haven't mentioned him just yet. Uh, Richard uh, Frodo Baggins, we were calling Frodo. Did you work much with him? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, you caught me there. Yeah, yeah. Frodo. So yeah, Frodo was. Um, I, I said there's a, there's a few names in terms of bartending that I work with over the years, you being one of them. Um, Neil Miller, did you ever work with Neil? Yeah, I did, yeah. You ever with Neil? Neil was an excellent bartender, obviously Snoxy was, yeah, Gillian's. In terms of bartenders that I have worked with over the years, Frodo was probably on the bar with me, I don't know, we probably together two or two or three years, and I, I can honestly say, as a bartender, he was one of the best that I worked with, and I'm not saying it for, I mean, very sad what happened with him um, a couple of years ago, but, yeah, we were, we were still very close even to, I'd spoken to him a couple of weeks before, um, sadly he passed away. But as a bartender, he was one one that I always said to other people, if you want to learn how to bartend in terms of engagement, I won't lie, he weren't the best at breaking down and he weren't the best at setting up. But in terms of working a front bar, he was very engaging, he was very accommodating, it just he, he, was, he was an excellent bartender. I employed him after he left Friday to come and work for me for a while. Um, and it was a pleasure having him as a bartender working for me as well. So yeah, no, it's um, it, it was sad. It was very, very sad. Um, and um, yeah, yeah, no, that was um, yeah, that was. So, a, a one moment. of the things. Like, do you know like where the? Because obviously, like when you say Frodo, you always think the straw trick, find yeah. the straw and catching it. Do you see him working on this, or was it something 
something. He yeah. saw. I mean, how did he come about with the idea? Cut the straws. This, this, <laughs> for him to get to that level of straw, trust me, we, we, the, 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 the straw wastage head office must have been really confused as to what was going on at Blue Water because there'd be a pile of straws every other day. You'd know that Frodo had been working because there'd be straws all under the stations and everywhere. And he did. He, he was working on that. That wasn't like something he did overnight. Everyone, every, everyone, every now and again, you'd pick up a straw and sort of throw it messing around and it'd somehow float and you couldn't figure it out. Well, he spent, I reckon, it must have been six months just flicking straws constantly. And it... <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, I was uh, wholly a part of that. There was a lot of screaming going on at him because there were just piles of straws everywhere, and you knew what shift he'd been on. But... Pick up your straws. Pick up yeah. your straws. So, yeah. so actually, obviously, name dropping anyway. Um, Daryl Webster, uh, Leon Campbell, um, yeah. Chaz. So, yeah. obviously, yeah. like, um, you worked with all these guys and everything else. I mean, um, it's hard to really say, like, a story on every single one because they're all so good. Um, so you keep in contact with most of them now, don't you? Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, not as much as we all get a bit older, don't we? We get families. We uh, some of us have got businesses. So yeah, no, it's not like we're in touch weekly. But um, I think every couple of months, me and Daryl will cross paths in some way, whether it just be sort of backwards and forwards on Messenger. Um, yeah, uh, Neil Finnis, for instance. Um, every now and again, he'll pop up, and we'll, we'll have a little chat on. On, on something or other. Leon's obviously living abroad now. Uh, Mark Bowerin from time to time. So yeah, you sort of, yeah, Speedo, actually I'll speak to Speedo a fair amount still, but that's Paul Handley. So yeah, from that uh, that original team, yeah, I would say if I've, yeah, if I've genuinely forgot anyone, I do apologise. Richie Benj, our far back, who was a legend, used to be able to set fire to him whenever you wanted. That was great fun. So, Actually, on funny stories, on funny stories, I was, I was just saying like, there's gotta be a, like, I always start off with a funny story and it gives you time to think of a funny story. So my story is, I was in um, Bazardon, uh, and what we did, uh, for some reason, uh, bartenders can always, as a bartender, you only see the top half of the bartender. So we thought it'd be funny one day to not wear trousers. So we had our aprons around our waist and we would carry on serving. But we was wearing boxer shorts, so we were quite well respected. But there was a girl that we used to work with called, <laughs> called Sean, and she used to wear a thong. So every five minutes, you'll walk past you and you'd be like, fair juice. I mean, she was so, so funny and so hilarious. But that was quite a funny story. So is there any funny stories that stand out in your head? One, ones that we should say or ones that we shouldn't say? Because there, there was quite... Say anything you want. You can say anything you want. Quite a bit of it. So the one, the, there is one involving um, Speedo that I always cite quite badly. And it was, I remember working the station once and there was three young, youngish guys that had come in. And Speedo, um, being the all-seeing, all-knowing bartender, was up selling them the ultimate Long Islands. And after the first ultimate Long Island, I'm pretty sure that they they pretty much had enough, and they weren't really uh, ready for any more. And um, but Speedo was adamant that he's no, no, I'm going to show you how this works, and I'm going to sell loads. And so off each I'm like, right. So after the second, I'm like, Speedo, you mate, you you might want to calm this down a little bit because those boys don't look like they're going to handle their drink. And I reckon in about half an hour, that's going to be a bit of a problem when he is. No, nah, it'll be all right, he says. So <laughs> you move it on about 45 minutes. And we get a, we get a telephone call when the phones are on the bar. It's like, can, uh, can someone go and check the toilets? Because there's a couple of blokes up there that are a bit worse for wear. So um, I'm like, Speedo, <laughs> you're checking on this one. So up he pops. And then he comes back down, white as a sheet. I'm like, what's the matter with you? And he's like, <sighs> like, Speedo. Well, he went, can you just come up and give me a hand? I went, I'll come up, but whether I give you a hand or not, I don't know. <laughs> so we get up, and there's one bloke with his head down the sink, um, and he's obviously, he's done what he's done, he's done in the sink, and he's in a bit of a mess, but he can roughly walk. But the other guy that's now in the cubicle, we've had to basically kick the cubicle door in, and where he's gone to sit on the loo and hasn't lifted up the seat lid, he's managed to uh, defecate, or desi whatever the, word, the terminology is, and... So we've now got uh, a situation whereby we have a, a man covered in his own feces that we're having to deal with. And I'm like that, Rob, Speedo, your problem, sunshine. Get him on. Okay. So, yeah, no, so changing the subject. So we're going moving forward. Okay. So obviously you won the UKs, which obviously 
you know, you must have. I mean, explain how you felt when you just won the UKs. I mean, what kind of feeling did you have? Yeah, I think there was, I think Tony said very similar. I think there was an element of relief. There was an element of excitement. But then equally, I know it sounds like a silly thing. I didn't feel like the job was done. Um, I Both finals that I made, I felt like I was ready when I went in. I made I made sure I prepped myself well. I made sure that um, I'm, I, I knew, always knew that front bars, like you said earlier, front bar was probably my strength anyway. Um, but I don't think people realised how hard I worked. And you don't, you can't just win a, any competition just based on a, a front bar or anything like that. So there was always a lot of effort that went into knowledge and stuff like that. So I think, I, well, I think after the, my, my sort of, it wasn't disappointment the first time around, but where I went, I'd come forth. And I always felt like I should have at least finished top three. And it was, it was my mistake. I sort of went out of time or whatever whatever happened that year. I sort of, by the time we did the UKs that year, I was I was prepped and I was ready. I hadn't been back long, but I was prepped mm. and I was ready. And I was looking at everyone thinking, no, I, I should be the one that comes out on top of this. Um, mm. But equally, while you're going through the competition, you're doing blind pour tests um, and all of that. You don't know how you're progressing um, until they make the announcement at the end. There's no sort of indication. Whereas when you move it on, to the other competitions, they do it day by day and you get a bit of feedback as to how you're getting on and what position you're in. So I think, yeah, no, it was, it, it kicked in later that night when we were in Roadhouse and having a few, me and Vinny were standing having a beer at the bar, uh, first and second in the UK, having a good cuddle and a couple of beers. Oh, so Vinny, uh, that, Vinny came second. So Vinny came uh, second that year. Vinny came second that year to me. So it was his second or third. No, he did come second. No, he definitely came second that year to me. Um, was he okay with that? Say that again. Was he okay with that? Did he think he... A cigar in hand and a beer with me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, yeah, yeah he was... He, uh, from my recollection of that night, um, mm -hmm. there was uh, there was never any animosity between uh, all of the competitions. I generally didn't ever feel like there was anyone that was sort of... I don't know, everyone was generally supportive of each other, I think. And I, if, they, if it wasn't, then I'd never experienced anything outside of everyone being quite happy for each other. There would be some people that might be disappointed, but ultimately, yeah, no, um, that particular year, I do remember quite a, a good moment. It was just me and him. There was a room full of Fridays people in Roadhouse and it was just me and him standing at the bar having a beer saying, are you number one and number two in the UK? And we were just sort of giving yeah, each other nice. fives and hugs. It was a nice moment. I never forgot that one. Did you ever like, um, like want to consider bartending in a roadhouse or something else or you just always liked the Friday's idea? Um, I think you, I think everyone did. Everyone sort of liked that idea. If you had a Friday's background, Roadie was a little bit cooler, weren't it? So it was like the cooler, the bigger brother of, of what Friday's was. <laughs> but I mean, I, I had offers from various bars at various points, um, irrelevant of competitions because um, without being big headed, I'd sort of built a reputation as just I, I was a good bartender. So, people sort of you, you take note of good bartenders, it doesn't need a title to be a good bartender. And I do, I, I made a conscious decision that I didn't really want to go into central London. Um, and I didn't want to do that because I equally knew that, that you could get wrapped up into the nightlife, the sort of the hours, the travel, all of the above. And I, I sort of looked at it and went, I don't really want that. I enjoy what I do. And I always had part of the reason I sort of left and come back was I always had a name to progress me so Fridays it wasn't a stepping stone or anything like that I was there for sort of five or six years or whatever it was in the end um but it was it was just a part of a journey for me so um Roadhouse did have its appeal when I think a couple of times I'd spoken to people up there I think when Ed was in charge at one stage I'd spoken to him um mm -hmm. when it was Ed Fellows was it Ed Fellow? Ed Fellow it was Ed Fellow whatever it was yeah so and I, there was a, a discussion for a period on that but to be honest, working the hours that they did, as much as it would be cool, I, I always had a, a bigger sort of focus on, I don't just want to be a bartender forever. I don't just want to do whatever. I'm, I'm looking for progression into various areas. So, yeah, no, it was, it had its appeal, um, yeah. but it was politely dismissed um, because I could do what I was doing. And at the same time, I was doing events with people like you and James Todd and, and stuff like that. And, <laughs> So yeah, there was there was a lot of sort of diversification going on, and I didn't need the uh, the added. Um, the added this is a weird. I mean, this is a weird question because I don't I don't even know like whether because um <laughs> the, uh, this is a, this is a bit of compliment to you because I always think there's only one Pete Marshall. But <laughs> did you ever model yourself on anyone else in the company or outside the company, like style or? you know, go like his ways he is or because he just... 
when we're, when, when we're, it's funny you should say it. So when we're talking compliments, um, it, Leon, actually, we, I think it was, I think it was the night that I won either, I think it was actually might have been the night I won the Europeans. And we were in Covent Garden because the Europeans took place in Covent Garden Fridays that year. So it was nice having a home crowd and the atmosphere was electric. Yeah, yeah. yeah. no, so yeah. there you go. Note that one down, Rob Stevens. You I go, didn't you know that. that was well. there. Yeah, so no, it was, uh, we had it at Covent Garden. And at the end of the, um, at the end of the, oh, I'd won the Europeans or whatever. And Leon just pulled me aside and went, listen, he said, um, obviously he was very happy and dancey and slightly tipsy, no doubt as well. But it, he, he turned around, he went, um, he, he said something to me, which basically along the lines of, you work the bar, um, like Spider does, who was Neil Miller. Um, you at the bar very much like Spider. And I think without, uh, Snocks all trained me, but subconsciously I, I always looked at Spider, Neil Miller, yeah. and sort of thought I like his style, how he is with people um, mm -hmm. and how he sort of manages the front bar. He was very, um, it was very corner bar and everyone was engaged in a, in a, 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 he was one of the best at it. So when Leon said that, I did actually find that a compliment. I hadn't, purposely done it but my memory because he wasn't working with the company anymore at that stage my memory was that i was i was quite proud that leon had sort of said there you go you're, you're very similar to spider um and that that, that that i found a big compliment and then again after having watched tony and realizing we're not this similar although my flair's obviously better than tony's let's be frank <laughs> <laughs> that's mm -hmm. i'll put him on that so tony said that if pete marshall who is a bang average flarer. I've got to pull him up on this. I'm not bang average, <laughs> I am below average. <laughs> Actually, saying that, yeah, I've got a story for you because I know uh, you might not know this and you might know this. You might have been in the crowd. Well, I've done um, Best Newcomer and Spider was doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and he done the cherry trick. Yeah. Uh, and he did it with Boston glasses. So did you remember, did you know this one? Did I you stole, know this? I stole it. <laughs> did you? Did I waited, you really? I waited uh, the year I won in the regionals, I stole that one. It was a brilliant, yeah. I loved it. it oh. Yeah. Yeah, because it was all the uh, UK finalists that were judging. So obviously he's in front of bartenders that all know the cherry trick, all know like anything else. And I thought it was such a great story to say because he was just seeing an orange <laughs> stuck in a boston glass ready to be going like one cherry two cherry three cherry how many cherries and we was just like we was in the fit of laughter all around the bar and it was just uh still yeah the, the guy was still, still the greatest trick ever the cherry yeah. trick for me is still there but yeah uh, uh, see uh, hopefully we're not recording this rob because okay. clearly oh that idea, but I thought I'd waited enough years that no one had ever remembered that he had done it. And now we've got it on record. Neil, exactly. I, I did steal it. Thanks a lot, mate. You got me for a regional. <laughs> <laughs> so so you went to uh, the Europeans at Common Garden. Okay. Yeah. Was you tested on the UK recipes or was it the American recipes? I think it might have been Jono who might have been helping organise a section of it, but they brought in some of the European management or, or whatever. Ultimately, it was a bit of a confused hodgepodge of both UK and international standards. And one of the things, for instance, when we did the speed round um, in the UK, we didn't have to garnish anything. So, um, and we were told that. So when it went to the world final, again, I know you're going to go on to that in a minute, but when we went on to the world final, I'd done the speed round and I never garnished anything. I didn't think anything of it. And when after I'd called time and they sort of said to me, are you sure you're done? I'm like, yeah, six drinks, correct recipes, pretty quick. I'd say I'm done like that. And then I've got to stay in the room and watch the next bartender do it and watch them garnish and the horror on my face. So after they finished that, I'm like, did you expect me to garnish those drinks? And they were like, yeah, you garnish drinks, don't you? I went, not in the UK composition, we don't. They went, but you did the Europeans. And I went, but the Europeans, we didn't have to either. Like, it was just this whole yeah. thing. So there was, it was... It was a bit of a crossover, and that was why the year after I wanted to try and bring it in line. Forget the UK. This, at the time, the UK probably had a reputation for being the hardest competition to win because yeah. we were we were pushing the boundaries in terms of how difficult we'd make it for the winner to to win the UK. But then when we crossed into probably easier territory, um, the competition was slightly different, and they didn't have much time to transition between them. So 
I, I, I tried to do it so that it would be easier for people going forward, and hopefully that has um, hopefully that has made a difference to people uh, when they when they've gone out to the worlds. Okay, was there a, is there a bartender that you would always have wanted to meet? Like a famous, um, I don't know, bartender, the or celebrity bartender you've always wanted to meet, or uh, you met? I, no, not really, to be honest. I don't mean that horribly because I, I, I don't know. I, what I quite enjoyed was wandering into places when people didn't know you and just watching if you knew that there might be a good bartender there, or you, you sort of wander into your roadies, or you. I think I, I think I've met most of the. Um, most of the generation that I was involved with and a little bit of the generation before me and a little bit of the generation after. So what I enjoyed doing was sitting on a bar, not being spoken to in the corner, watching a good bartender just work a bar. So it wasn't mm. about an individual and I've never been one that's been sort of starstruck by anyone in particular, Or but there were names that you wanted to see. You, Rob, you were a name for many years before I actually got to meet you as like just, a, just an incredibly good bartender and they're the people that you want to you want to learn from, you want to watch, you want to see, you want to be around. Um, mm. So there wasn't anyone that I was sort of like, I've got to go and see that guy. I knew that I'd bump into them at some point or come across them at some stage. But no, it was, I don't know, I suppose that's a, a little bit of the element of why mm. I, I sort of was okay in the competitions, because I wasn't starstruck in any way. It was just, you're, you're just someone to beat. I'll beat you. Mm. And that was just the way it was for me. I just wanted to get in there and I was confident enough in my own abilities that it didn't matter who was in front of me. So even with not doing, say, for instance, not doing garnishes on your drinks, you still won the Europeans. So well, that was OK in the Europeans. So that, that, they had that was OK in that competition. I won. I won both days in the Europeans. I didn't find not, not arrogantly. Um, I didn't find it particularly challenging. There was um, it was Adam Larson, I think, had come over from Norway. He was sort of the person that was going to give me the most um, the most stress. Um, and he had Adam McDonald was his trainer, um, and Macca come over with him, and it was it was like a scene out. You like a bit of Rocky. It was like something out of Rocky Four, the way he'd been, yeah. been trained to a T. This guy, this guy was going to be the next European hope, and he come over. He come into come and stepped foot on British soil, and he found out what it was all about. <laughs> so, 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 so yeah, so you obviously um, you got that buzz from um, winning the UKs. Uh, you've just been crowned European champion. Um, so how do you feel now? You just won the Europeans. I was looking forward to getting into the Roadhouse, having a few beers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Deja vu all over again. And I was even more excited that it was, it was going to be in Vegas. So uh, that night, all I cared about was just dancing around, knowing that I was going to go to Las Vegas on, um, on a, a bit of a free trip. And then I think when it all sunk in at about, about a month later, it was um, right coming in. Let's 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 get our head down and let's take this very seriously and dig in. So you you did take it serious because like because when I talk to you, you're saying so like if it happens, it happens, and then, and then it happens, and then you go if it happens, it happens, and then it happens. Did it go like that all the way? To an extent, I put the work in though. So, but I equally accept that you've got a anyone that wants a bit of advice when it comes to the competitions, and I know Tony's very similar to me as well. Yeah. If you put yourself in the right position by learning what you need to learn, by the time you're hitting those, whether it be the tests, whether it be the front bars, whether it be whatever, there's no point stressing or worrying about it. You, you, any work you've done is now, it's there. You've either done enough or you haven't. Yeah. And for all yeah. of the, the attitude, if, if you go in constantly stressed about how it's going to turn out, then I think that that can affect you. So I put enough work in that by the time I was hitting the point of competition, um, say that, that that first year, I know Graham McDonald come down to Crawley because he was like, who's this bloke that's in the UK final that I've never even heard of? And he come down and I remember talking to, to Graham, um, I think it was after the UK final that year or the year before he went, what shocked me more was I just come down and sat in the bar. You didn't know who I was because I didn't know who he was. I worked that bar that night and I realised you were a serious contender because for all of the, the fun and whatever type of character I may or may not be, I take what I do very seriously. So I'll just make sure I put myself in the position that when it comes down to having the fun, the knowledge is there and I'm ready to go. So yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, that's, I did, I, I certainly put the, the work in, I made sure of that. Because I remember like, uh, I don't know how I got the message or I don't even know if I spoke to you or, because you did have a, 
what I call a paparazzi follow you to Vegas as well. So um, so I don't know whether they spoke to me, but obviously, because uh, when i done my world finals in 2003, I was winning every category. So when I was going into the final thing, I was going, this is mine to lose kind of thing. So I just need to do uh, a normal front bar and I should be all right. When I spoke to you the day before, you was running ninth. <laughs> <laughs> so he was going after the first I was going he's blown it he's blown it and then a day later he's won it he's won it and I'm like and the heck did he win from ninth to first I mean what did you do uh, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's, um, that first day was very frustrating I remember well I'll tell you one thing I did do after the first day I had a very late night because I thought I had blown it <laughs> I don't know. There was there was a couple of things that happened on the first day that part of it was not knowing the competition, despite the fact I'd asked lots of questions, I hadn't received probably the yeah. correct information. Part of it was a, a, a bad decision of taking on some new poor spouts and messing my own poor test up when I'd taken my own spouts out there, but just saw these really nice, fresh, clean ones. I thought, oh, I'll have those ones, but they weren't the ones <laughs> practicing yeah. with for four months. So yeah. I, I, going into the... the Front bar was always me anyway. I always enjoyed that aspect of it. I I, I always knew that it was going to be a bit of a lottery when it comes to the It is going to be a bit of a lottery because it's very subjective. Um, as yeah. to what people are going to like judging panels, managers, like all of that. So yeah. I think um, I think by the time we hit the second day, um, I, I was I was incredibly frustrated because the first day uh, for all of it, for all of my abilities on the front bar. I always felt like I was one of the strongest people technically as well. And I, I felt like I'd let myself down technically. And mm. there was, some of it was me, but some of it was out of my hands. And yeah. it did. I, I was very frustrated after that first day. And I kept saying all that night, I said, can we just not start this day again? Because now that I've got all the information, I'll be able to I'll give these guys that they'll know exactly what they're looking at rather than seeing this guy that's sort of languishing somewhere down. So by the time I come out and done the, uh, the front bar, it was... It was, it was, it, I actually thought that I could have done better on it that day as well. I, I, I felt like it was a solid routine, but it wasn't wasn't one of my better ones. But obviously what I put together was um, was quite well received and lots of energy, lots of fun. I treated it like I would work in the bar. And I think that's like, like I did watch Tony's interview with you. And like Tony says, if, you, if you're genuine, I'd like to believe that I am someone that wants to serve people drinks or have a bit of fun or whatever. Mm -hmm. If you're that person, that will come across in the right way. If you're too set and too right, this must happen and this must happen, I, I, I can adapt to whatever the situation was. You, nice, you had a nice compliment from uh, Rob Gilks. Um, I don't know if you listened to that one. Yeah. And he was saying about, like, um, and I think it's really, really good because, like, when somebody, when you, when you project yourself um, to people, you don't know who you're talking to. And when you've made an impact on someone that goes on and on and on to do great things, win competitions, and and you feel that you probably um, planted that seed into that person to actually to make a great bartender. I mean that I think sometimes winning competitions is one thing, but to um, to encourage and to to make someone uh, give a compliment that way was a thought was really really nice thing to say. Um, so I, I want to say to Rob on that because I won't lie, I don't remember that visit to Reading Fridays. And when I watched Rob's interview, it did, it did exactly what you said there. It did strike a chord that it's, I, I probably only met him a few times ever. Um, mm. And it, I did find it a huge compliment that I, not, not horribly, but I, I don't remember that particular visit or anything like that. But the fact that you, you've got that ability. Tony's got that ability. But like all of these people that know what they're doing and care about what they're doing, that will come out and that will shine onto other people. And it, it did. It, when I, it did put a smile on my face when I heard him say that because it does show the influence that we've we can all have on generations coming through. Yeah. And it's great that see, seeing a bar back come through to bartend or yeah. seeing a great bar team or just like you say, you, don't, you never know who you're dealing with or what you're dealing with, whether that's guest or staff member so yeah you not you, however you want to be perceived 
it's, you can't just do it with the guests and then be horrible with your bar back. It, it's sort of there's a balance to be had on everything, and that I think that, that does come through and that does reflect. Cool. So uh, on your flare moves, okay, we've got the one that always <laughs> stands out is the chicken wing. Yes, uh, uh, the chicken wing. Uh, did you invent this chicken wing move, or even if someone else did, I'm claiming it because <laughs> I did a joke. And if I see others were using it after I, I thought I'd invented it. But yeah, no, the um, we had the chicken wing. Yeah, no. Um, outside of that, I had the one bottle and the one tin. <laughs> <laughs> And also, do you always have to say chicken wing when you land the chicken wing? No, no, I don't say when you land the chicken wing, no. I mean, I just started going... <laughs> it was a joke to start with. I always remember on the bar, you just go, chicken wing, like this, and you'd be landing a glass on the chicken wing. And I was like, does he have to say chicken wing when he lands the chicken wing? So I was like that. But yeah, every time I think of your flair, I think chicken wing. So... Was there another any other favourite move you had apart from the chicken wing? Um, no, do you know, I, I liked. The, I always enjoyed the simple stuff. Like, I, and that was the reason I, did, I wasn't one that would spend hours learning out the flare because I could flare, and yeah. I wasn't fussed about. I, I learned how to do three bottles for the world final because it was expected of you. Um, I don't know if I even used it in the world final or not. I, I genuinely couldn't tell you if I at any point other than the technical day, which I. They asked you to do a three bottle, and I did a three bottle, um, and that was it. How did that go? Did he land it? Yeah, yeah, I landed. Yeah, I, I think I got. I think it was ten moves, whatever it was. I got ten out of ten on on the flare side of it, but I'd always sort of refused to learn three bottle just because I wasn't. I was. I wasn't a flare bartender. I was a bartender as far as I was oh. concerned. So I learned it because I, I needed to for the competition, and I did it. But I never really used it. In fact, I never used it on the bar at Blue or anything like. that anywhere else I did it for the world final because they asked me to tick a box so I ticked that box um but yeah no yeah so I don't think in the front bar on the, the world final I actually did anything other than bottle and tin I was balancing lots of stuff I was having a bit of fun doing a bit of magic doing stuff like that but yeah no the yeah no uh, the, the outside of I, I, I liked good simple like the behind the backs the two just a couple of glasses bottle and tin little flicks just all neat cuts I just enjoyed I enjoyed seeing someone that it's not completely about the show. It's about making someone a part of what you're doing. And the second you step back, that's not to take away from the guys that are excellent at flair, but the second you step back and start really going to town with the bottles, for me, it was almost like you're making it all about you now, as opposed to making it about the person that you're doing it with as well. And that's not to say that that's a bad thing, but I always wanted to stay talking to them and having a bit of fun with them and, and sort of and stuff like that. So that was probably why I was less engaged with flair with my 7.2 moves or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so you're in Las Vegas, yeah, and um, you're standing there. They've gone third place, da -da -da -da, second place, don't know who second place was. And the winner is, did you at any point believe that you had won it? After you've day one, you was ninth and you're not going that well. Did you have an inkling that you was going to win this competition? So Good story on that one as well, Rob Stevens. So that's why I'm here. That's why I'm here. There we are. We're standing on stage and they're they're yeah. doing all the chat. And it was um, do you know Michael Buffer? Ladies and gentlemen, that's good. So Michael Buffer was the compound. Um, top bloke had a nice chat with him backstage as well, talking to him about boxing. So there we are on stage, and Michael Buffer's going through the talking about the judges and talking about everything that we've been all doing. And I'm standing there talking to I think it was Brian Kayla from whatever American story he was at. And Standing there mattering away, I'm not listening because as far as I'm concerned, like I've ruined it on day one. So, yeah. oh, do you know what? Nat, chatting away. And anyway, something, something, something. And they just said Pete Marshall. And I went, did he say my name? <laughs> I, went, I think he did. I went, what was that for? And he went, I think you've won something. And I went, all right. So I walked over. I genuinely at this moment didn't know what it was I was walking over. Turns out I'd won the second day because they did it, the prize for the first day, you get $1,000. Prize for the second day, yeah, you get yeah. $1,000, whoever gets the most points. So I'm like, oh, yeah. wicked. That's some beer tokens and a bit of blackjack later on tonight. Yeah. Get in there. So I'm thinking, <laughs> right, so if I won one of the days, I might make the top three now. That'd be all right, oh. wouldn't it? Considering my first day. So off I toddle back over to Brian. And I'm like, yeah, check me out. <laughs> 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 
So I was standing now, and they sort of going through, going back and right. So we're now up to the top three, and I'm like, right, I'll take a third. After that first day, I'm, I'll, I can live with that. Yeah. Then that's, um, I can't remember who was third in the end. Um, probably Brian Zaka. I don't know, though. Um, oh. And then it's like, it's me and Gary's shoes, the last two left standing. I'm like, to be fair, to come second to Gary's shoes, had a brilliant couple of days. Yeah. Like, I'll take that, considering my first day. And they yeah. just, and the winner is, and I stood there, you can probably find it on something somewhere. And I literally stood there and just went, really? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was too far behind. So they then hand me a propeller, which yeah. I'm then kissing and hugging and stuff like that. And to be honest, I, it, I didn't believe it. And I didn't believe it because of what had happened on the first day. Mm. So, and I, as much as I had the ability to, to, um, to pull off a very good front bar, knowing that there was better flares in the competition, mm. And that quite often the American judges quite like the sort of the the more um, the more advanced flaring as opposed to sort of the style that I I am, which is a, a sort of a combination of everything. Yeah. Uh, I was shocked, and it, to be honest, I, it, it probably took. I don't think it's even sunk in now, to be honest, especially yeah. after that first day. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so you've just won. I mean, who um, who came over to support you? You know, but well, we had quite the team over there, so. Um, Daryl was there, Chaz was there, uh, Mark was there, um, trying to think who else from Blue was there. Um, can't remember who else was there. They were definitely there from Blue. I had all of my old school mates were there. Um, there was a crowd, I had about 25 to 30 as a crowd. I had family that had come over. Yeah. Um, so it was it was just a nice, and that was, that was the, the night before the second day. It was nice because we were all mm. uh, in Carnival Court, all of us having a drink and sort of just having a good social as a, as a big crowd of people. And it was nice because none of us had been to Vegas by that point and we were just there together. I just enjoyed the ambiance. I was, I was the excuse for everyone to have gone. Yeah. But it, it was nice seeing everyone together, enjoying themselves. Um, and yeah, no, it was, yeah. So it, yeah, about 25 to 30 people. And it was, first one on stage was Daryl Webster. Remember yeah. the moment that Daryl yeah. still told the story that he sent to the security guard. In a moment, when they stop taking pictures, I'm going straight on that stage and give him a cuddle, and you ain't getting in my way. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, the security just went, okay. <laughs> so I literally got dive bombed by Daryl and a couple of the others as soon as I'd won. Mm -hmm. um, a nice picture somewhere that I've, I never got, which was I'm sort of in the middle with this propeller sticking out of the top somewhere, and everyone was sort of trying to jump on top. It was good fun. It was, it was nice. It, it was it was nice seeing the excitement in everyone else. Now, how do you get like a propeller like that home? Does it go in like suitcases or do you bring it with you? Do you know what the irony is? It's actually right there. It's lived in my front room for a couple of years. I'll pull it out in a minute for you. Um, no, the uh, the Americans sent it over um, about six weeks later. So we'll get it all engraved and we'll send it over and et cetera, et cetera. So about six weeks later, a box turned up, a massive box. Um, and inside it was my propeller. So yeah, no, it's uh, so so obviously you can't go to the roadhouse to celebrate. <laughs> so where do you go uh, in Vegas to celebrate? Did you go out? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I remember uh, falling out of pure nightclub in Caesar's Palace with Daryl at about <laughs> four in the morning and being told that I had to be at a conference at seven. Um, and I remember being woken up by a security guard because TGI's needed me downstairs at a conference and I just slept. Through. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was quite a night of celebration, I won't lie. Um, so no, we, um, we, 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 we basically bounced around a good few bars. We, had, we were at Shadows that straight afterwards, the biggest round of drinks I've ever bought, went into Shadows um, in Caesar's Palace. Um, and anyone that was part of my crowd, and in fact, anyone that had been watching the world final, I just yeah. went, right, buy them a drink, buy them a drink, buy them a drink. I think the round come to about $900, but... It was um it was nice. We just literally took over shadows and it was my crowd and there was others that have been there to watch their mates and whatever else. <laughs> there was a lot of people and a lot of booze. <laughs> but it was um yeah, no, so we decided then we bounced around a few places. It was good. That was awesome. Nice. Right. So here we go. I've got some fire fire round questions. Okay, right. So speed round. Um here we go. Favorite pour, one ounce or two or one and three quarters? One. One ounce pour. One ounce. So, did <laughs> did you invent any flare moves, chicken wing? <laughs> chicken wing. That was that one. Friday's food, uh, a dessert or steak? Uh, oh no! Do you know what I used to like? I used to just like the pico de gallo. 
I used to like Friday <laughs> Pico. I, I, no, forget the steak, forget the dessert. I just I used to eat bowls of Pico. Loved bowls it. Of Pico. Did you make that at your, uh, your place? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Comes from uh, Cocktail the movie. Love it or we'll hate it. Mate, if anyone says they hate it, they should be shot. It is the greatest film ever. It is a brilliant film. Did you ever, uh, did you ever go to uh, New York? Uh, is any? No. Uh, again, I, uh, I am the worst person in the world. I just, I, I very much live for the moment, and I've been to New York a couple of times, and never bothered to go. And there it, it, it was, I went to, I went to Venice a couple of years ago, yeah. and uh, when I got back, Tony and Vinny said, "So how was it?" And I went, "What Venice?" I said, "Yeah, it was really nice." I went, "No, Harry's Bar." And I went, is that in Venice? And they were like, yeah, home of the Bellini. And I went, oh, yeah, of course, I learned about that, didn't I? Never went, no. Yeah. no. Never went. Never went. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not uh, worried. Well, I'm you answered this one. That's right. Service bar or front bar? Front bar. All day long. Front. I enjoyed the bar as well, though. I did enjoy the service bar. I enjoyed that. That was a good battle. Always enjoyed it. I think you even answered this one. Favourite cocktail, an old-fashioned or whiskey sour? It's got to be an old-fashioned all day long. There you go. Uh, a busy bar or steady bar? I'd probably say steady, actually. I could deal with busy. It was like I'm, I'm, different moods, different things. But if you gave me a what, what do I want consistently, I'll take a steady bar all day long. But busy was. That's when the atmosphere started ramping up and the electric started. That was good. Yeah. Uh, Favourite skill, magic, flair or other? Magic, flair or other. Is that three options? Is that like yeah. Flair or other, <laughs> other, other, anything as I like. Other, other, I'll take a bit of everything. You know, bit of everything. So, um, oh, who do you prefer, Prodigy or Baha Men? <laughs> Is that even a question? Okay, all right. If I've got, if I've got to select someone, I'll go on. I'll take the Prodigy. Followed by a bit of Fleet of Mac. Well, who let the dogs out is the bar, man. Jeez, I forgot that. I'll come out to that. I know. <laughs> That's why I put it in there. Okay, he's got to know bar, man. I am the worst in the world. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and what is your best joke you know? Oh, wow. Um, uh, you, you hear the one about the magic tractor? <laughs> no. Do you know the one about the magic tractor? No, I have not. No, I don't know. Driving down the road, turns into no. a field. <laughs> turns into a what? Field. Field, turns into a field. Nice. That's a good one. That is a good one. So, where's it? Be- is that the best one you got? That's all I've got. <laughs> That's all you got. That is good, though. Oh, thank you so much for today. It's been absolutely brilliant. It was absolutely. So, if someone um, obviously wants to get in touch with you, yeah. How do they do that? Probably, I am, again, social media is probably, it's always going to be the best way. But yeah, I mean, go on Facebook. I think my, my, my profile up until I got married was still me in a Friday's top. But just Pete Marshall on Facebook. I'm not really, I've got accounts for Instagram and Twitter, but I don't tend to use them. So hit me up on Facebook. Um, and if not, then you can always look me up a bit of a shameless promotion at the King's Arms, Bexley Heath. That's, that's my current project. So um, you can always follow us on the social medias there, and it's normally me controlling most of that. So I'll, uh, I'll pick up messages and stuff via that as well. So, but yeah, no, however, or contact Rob Stevens, he's got my number. Yes. He can always pass it on, can't he? So, do you ever, I've got the last two questions here. Do you have any regrets uh, within Fridays, apart from obviously, was it your Masters, wasn't it? That's, that's probably the, the, the one I'd say probably that was the biggest one. It was. Yeah, I never, I'd, I'd done everything that there was to sort of do except for get me blue cap. And um, I kind of look at it with a wry smile, but yeah, it'd have been nice to have actually, when I look at I all see, these nice masks, you, 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 and I'm I, thinking, I, oh, you beat me. You can, you can have one of mine, I've got three. Is it sweaty though? Yeah, probably sweaty though, <laughs> but you can put it up in your bar. You can put it in your bar. I'll bring it over. I'll bring no. you over. I'll write that down, blue cap. So I've got three, three of them. I have, so I don't need three heads. You've got, <laughs> so, you've got to sign it, and I'll put it up. And it's not my blue cap; it's yours that I'm looking after. Okay, blue cap. There we go. Done. That's going to come your way. Yeah, and uh, any, yeah. any confessions? You got a confession mm-hmm. apart from a speedo? <laughs> That's a good confession. Um, do you know what? I knew you was going to ask this, and I don't know. It's oh, for all of the fun and games of it all. I think I was I was quite a, a professional when it come down to doing the job and um, getting on with it. I 
I'd like to believe that I was a pretty solid guy to work with. So in terms of it, I, 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 no, I'm not, I wouldn't say there's a, I, I could have probably been um, day to day a little bit more on my knowledge. I tended to plump up for the competitions as opposed to worrying about it day to day. Um, but no, outside of some of the mischief when we were going over to other stores and, and doing bits and bobs, there was a crayfish gumbo that ended up in a boot in Croydon at once. And there was, there was clean film going around bars at Lakeside the day before QS and C's and bits and bobs. I, I was sort of parts of those. I wasn't the instigator, but I was definitely <laughs> part of those. <laughs> so we did so nothing dinner. really. <laughs> so nothing really then. <laughs> I, I, was, I, was, I certainly wasn't... Um, I, I wasn't trying to slow the processes down. I was uh, maybe egging them on a little bit. So uh, we did have some mischievous thinkers in our team. It was all Daryl's fault. It was <laughs> <laughs> well, I, could, I've, I, could, I actually forgive you for all that stuff as well. But absolutely, he's been, uh, well, I think I've enjoyed it more than uh, anything. So I've had a great, great time. And uh, just seeing your lovely little face. And uh, obviously, it's the uh, King Arms, isn't it? The King Arms is where yep. you are now. Current project. Look, Yep, so uh, it looks absolutely amazing, it does. I mean, you guys got to check this out. It's absolutely a beautiful bar. Uh, what's the address again? Uh, well, it's in Bexley Heath, so 156 Broadway, Bexley Heath. So if you look yeah. up on Bexley Heath, it's, it's the only one that will pop up. We're, we're, cool. we're top of Google at the moment. <laughs> yes, number one Google. So, well, thank you for uh, obviously agreeing to do this. Obviously, this has been a, an absolute blast. And uh, watch the other ones I've got coming up. Um, so, you know, I've seen, um, I'm sure they're going to be just as, uh, just as great as this one has been. And, uh, and as I said, like, thank you for taking me down memory lane again as well. It's been absolute fun. And I'm Rob Stevens, and this is Legends in Bartending. And um, please subscribe. Go on, and go on, so. I, I want to say something, Rob. I want to say well done for you doing this, mate, because for all of it, what you put together and how you've done it, Obviously, everyone knows that's watching this and they're watching it, I dare say, because of you and the fact that you're bringing together this collection of bartenders from a lot of different generations. It's a credit to you that everyone's got that much respect for you that they yeah. want to be a part of this. And so as this grows, I think it's an excellent thing that you're doing, mate. Well done. It is, it is such a, okay. a cool project and it is nice watching and listening to other bartenders from around everything that we've all been doing and that we all love. And that you've helped us go down the journey as well. So, mate, you're an absolute legend for doing that. So, thank you for that. Okay. And I also apologise if I've forgotten to mention anyone as well. I do apologise. Probably means I don't like you, but there you go. Text me. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure, like, I'm sure they will uh, be in touch anyway, because obviously there's some amazing names you've mentioned uh, throughout the entire interview. So, I'm sure it's going to be great. So, but watched you work that bar that night, and I realised.